Hello, good day and welcome back. So today we're going to look a little bit cl more closely at go routine context. And don't worry with the context word there right now. Over time, you'll have a better feel for what context is. Um, you can find a number of definitions for context. And in the, the, and in the air quotes, which you can see me doing, of context of computer programming, it has a certain type of meaning. But different frameworks and also say, I'll give you a context or whatever. So our libraries and stuff. So we're not going to really try and define it. We're going to try and work with it and get a feel for what it is. I know that sounds very weird, but just trust me. And we're going to talk about what a go routine does. And in, in that way, what we're really going to be looking at is what it's responsible for. And notice that's different than what a go routine is. I'm not going to try and tell you what a go routine is just yet, because that's a conversation that's going to take us down sort of like a rabbit hole. Because we'll say, oh, go routines are lightweight tread, but then we'll have to talk about what a tread is, how that differ from, um, like, you know, a OS tread, and we'll talk about processes and how, um, you know, treads um, run, are used to run your process. And, you know, you could have multiple treads per process and, you know, of course, multiple treads for multiple processes and all this other stuff. So, we're not going to go down that road just yet. Hopefully, by the end of this, we'll kind of get a feel for that. And maybe at a very high level, we'll be able to come back and say, okay, now that you understand this, now we can say, well, you can have multiple threads per processor, blah, 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 right? Uh, but we'll ignore all that. And we're just going to say, what a go route stick to, what it's responsible for. Um, we're going to talk about when does your program end. Um, we kind of know where your program ends, when the main function, because that's where your program starts in main where your main function in, right? Uh, one of the things we're going to mention here and later on is that how many go routines can you have in one program? A whole lot. And again, if you know anything about threads, um, if you create too many threads more than you have um, cores, CPU cores, or processors, eventually doesn't give you the benefit just because managing the threads takes more overhead than you get from actually being able to run multiple threads. So... But in Go Routine, um, you could pretty much, and you probably would run into that eventually too, but even on a single core machine, you can have hundreds of Go Routine. And that's because of how Go Routines are created versus how threads are created. All right, again, we're not going to get into the details of Go Routine versus thread right now. We can talk, stick to what Go Routine do for you. So here's um, um, something important that I want to stand out, and I want you to keep it in the back of your mind. What happened when mains end? Your program ends when main ends are complete. We know that already, that once your program starts at main, and once main, you reach the end of main and that return, that's when your program ends. This means, the important thing here, is this, since your program ends when main ends, it means no matter how many Go routines you create, a million, two zillion, once main ends, all of them gets terminated, killed or whatever, however you want to call it. Terminated, killed, be gentle, or be harsh they all end at the same, also get cleaned up, okay? This is really, really important. I'm going to try to demonstrate this um, later on in the video. All right. So in the first video, I kind of showed you, I went back and said, okay, let's look at our Chapter 7, Section 3 or 4 example where we had a producer and a consumer and try to make that, the producer at least, a go routine and have it produce stuff. And we'll eventually get to see how that's done. So here, let's start off with something very simple. So here is a simple program, and this program will, can run. I can assure you of that. And if I leave this and I go here, and I look at my cat main zero, uh, cat main, and I can do it again to show you they haven't changed it. And I say go run main. You'll see it runs and it exits immediately. It doesn't do anything. So this is a valid program, okay? You should notice by now. When you invoke, um, the, your program to be run by the operating system. I'm going to skip over a bunch of detail. Eventually, the go run time is going to create a go routine, and I'm, I'm going to number it, and, and I'm calling it go routine one. And go routine is responsible for running your main um, function, and it does this by creating an execution context. Again, let's don't focus on what the meaning of the word context is. I'm openly by just using it over and over, you get an idea. And so basically, it's an environment. Um, it's a logical construct, but, uh, you know, context is actually going to be a set of values and so on. It maintains 
to be able to manage the execution of the Go function and any other function that Vo Go uh, main invoke directly. You think of it as a way of keeping track of where you are in the Go um, in, the, in your program as you traverse through main, okay? And so this is one Go routine that's going to be created and it's going to say, hey, go create a context and run my main function. And when main ends, your program ends. Now, let's just say that we introduce another function and it doesn't matter the detail of this function. It could be an empty function. It could do a ton of stuff. It doesn't really matter. And for main, I call this function. Notice I just invoked the function, but it's a call. I say call because if I use a assembly language or something, I actually have something like say, you know, call routine or something like that. Okay. And so I invoke this function. So we say call this function, producer. And what happened is the go routine one is still, oh, I misspelled routine up there. I'm going to go fix that. But I'll fix that in the slides. Let's go back up and make sure that I misspelled it here. All right, geez. All right. I misspelled it everywhere. So, all right. Let me. Okay, routine. Routine. All right, this is the go. You know, I didn't notice this all this video, all these videos, I, um, all these slides I created. I did not notice this until um, I was going through it, which means I have done all these other slides here. Oh my gosh! All right, and I don't want to really start over right now, so I'm gonna fix it right now and keep going. So let's fix it. Da da T I N E. And don't try to ignore what you're seeing on the screen now until I explain it, okay? And last one, I think. Last one. And the last one. Okay. Now you know I'm not having any help doing these videos because if I had some help, they would most likely have caught this. Okay. So um, here we go. So I have this call to the function producer. And so as you can see, I still have this one go routine. It's going to be called to manage, set up a context to manage main, invoke main, but become main call this function producer. My go routine is if for whatever reason I need to, the processor need to be paused in the middle of producer, that go routine, because it's maintain a context, is going to say, oh, I know that our main call producer and I'm paused inside of producer somewhere. And then when it's time to run again, it would continue, resume from there and continue and note how it, after producer exits or finish, it has to return back to main. Okay? So that's where the context information is tracked so that it knows that, oh, hey, I finished producer, I, I return back to main. But it's still one go routine. One go routine. That's why when we went into producer and we produced um, some values on our channel, our channel had to have buffer because producer here needed to stick some value into that channel and if it was blocked trying to stick some value now you see why the, the go run time would say hey the one and only root go routine i have for this application this process is blocked so all process go routines are deadlocked and it terminates because if it allows you that condition you would never be able to resume because there's nothing else to be able to read from that channel does that make sense okay so next example I create another function called consumer. So I call my function producer, then I call my function consumer. Notice what's happening. When producer finishes, like we said, it returned to main, hence why main can now call consumer. Okay? And still, I have one go routine that goes and runs through producer. When producer finishes, it comes back into main, see that our main says call consumer, it goes and run consumer and come back. Okay? But I still only have one go routine. And that explains why when I'm inside of producer, I do whatever producer says to do, and that's it. I can't be doing anything else, okay? And only when I return, then I could do the work inside of consumer and return. And, of course, my program ends, all right? Next example. So, so far, we've seen that the responsibility of a Go routine is to run a function, right? Create a context or a function and run it. That's what I said before up here, right? Transitivity of a Go routine is to manage the execution context of a function, and that's what it's doing. Now, when I stick the keyword Go in front of producer, notice the difference between these two. The only difference here is this doesn't have the keyword Go in front of producer. Here it does. What happens is my Go routine 1 
is created and creates a contest around Maine. It's run in Maine. And then Maine says, oh, I want to into, invoke the go statement, which is some black box for us. It's basically provided by the go runtime, the go library, all this other stuff, the go language. So it's a black box for us. So we don't see what happened in there. But magic happens in there. And what it does is it creates a second go routine. Let's call it go routine two. And it creates that go routine and say, hey, go routine two, I want you to manage, create a context and manage the function, the execution of the function, produce a function. Okay? And it returns back to main. And then in main, it says, oh, I got to go run the function consumer. But notice who's running the function in the consumer function. It's my go routine one. Go routine two is off managing the execution of and managing the context for producer function uh, for the producer function. And now we can see we have two go routine sort of running concurrently. I, I really trying to not use the word parallel, right? Concurrently. And we'll see why. Because if I have one processor, it's bouncing between the two. So I can imagine my system when you have one CPU, uh, one processor, it comes and it runs here and it gets into here. It creates this function. And just before it starts running the first line of this function, it stops and it says, oh, it's time to go run go routine one again. And go routine one, well, that at return. So it goes and it runs, start running consumer. And it got some in the middle of consumer. And it says, oh, you know what? It's time to go back to go routine two. And so go routine two is like, ah, I was in the middle of this producer, so I'm going to continue from there, blah, blah, blah. Bumps in between them. A lot of words there. Not going to make sense if this is the first time you're sort of hearing this sort of thing. Um, but hopefully, um, thing. Now, remember what I said way back here. When does your program end? It ends when your main program, your main um, function ends, okay? So that means that once my function returns here at the end of main, this go routine two also goes away. Hence why I try to illustrate that by making sure that the arrow for this go routine does not go past the um, end of main here. Because once main end, bam, everything um, gets cleaned up. All right, uh, let's keep going down. Let's say I put go in front of producer and go in front of consumer. Same thing that happens. Go routine one comes in, running my main program. Black box creates a go routine two to run producer, returns to main. Main creates a black box, goes in there, creates another go routine three, and that runs consumer. And then it returns and mains terminates, and all two days go routine also get termi terminated, right? Gets killed off. Now, as it is, even if I put some code inside of consumer and producers to um, some work for them to do, because the fact that oh, these go routine get launched, and again, they can run by themselves, and I return to main, and immediately afterward I exit, it doesn't matter what these guys are trying to do. It wouldn't be enough time for them to get anything done, and they're going to get cleaned up. So there's a good chance you're not going to see anything happen, and I'll demonstrate that in a minute. And that also comes back to this idea, when does my program end? When my main function ends. And so when main ends, it doesn't matter what these other guys got launched to do, they're going to get cleaned up. Now, finally, this now should help you understand why is it when this is a much nicer setup for producers and consumer, because we have a channel. And here I took away the whole black box to go and stuff because we know it's going to create go routines. And we can see that if we have a channel and we tell our producers, hey, go produce on that channel, that's going to return back pretty much immediately. Then we tell our consumer, go consume from that channel. Now we have a go routine that's run our producer, a go routine that's run our consumer. And the way they're communicating with each other, which they're not really communicating with each other, but indirectly, is the producer is pushing value onto that channel and the consumer is pulling value off of that channel, okay? And with that, it doesn't matter if my channel is buffered or not because if it's buffered and producer produces so fast that it fills up, eventually he's going to try and push a value on there and he's going to be blocked. And so all that happens is go routine cannot run. But this one gets blocked, but that's okay. They have two others that can run. And so here this guy's running and he starts consuming value and makes space available. And at some point, the runtime goes, the go runtime goes, oh, well, now you can put values back on the channel because there's space. And even if this channel is an, um, doesn't have a buffer, 
Well, when he tries to put a value on there, if the consumer is not ready to receive it, he blocks. But as soon as this consumer is ready to receive it, he can run, push that value on there, and then the consumer now can go read it. Similarly, if the consumer tries to read a value and the producer is not ready to put a value on there on a buffer channel or a channel that is empty, well, he, this consumer would simply be blocked until the producer is ready to put a value on there. Again, in this setup, if these two guys, regardless of what, how much work I got for them to do, since I'm returning to main and exiting immediately, they too will get cleaned up. Okay, so let's look at some code. So let me save that, bap, bap, come back here. And so we just run this code. And so now we want to run the code of, we want to say, let's do a function called producer. And we're going to do a function called consumer. And we're going to call, we're going to say go producer and go consumer. Now, in the example that I had on the slide, I didn't have anything in there, but let's do this. Print Lynn, hello, I am the producer. And then we'll do something similar and say I'm the consumer. And now we'll let that save and then we go here and we go go run main. And notice again, you don't see anything on the output, right? And you're thinking, oh, this is because of what I told you. This launches those go routine, but then it exits immediately. To be able to see those output, we have to give the main some time. So let's just do this. Let's do time that sleep. And let's just sleep for maybe 200, 100 milliseconds. Is that enough time? Let's see. Right? And so we're going to have it sleep for a, a, a 100 milliseconds. And then now let's run it and see. And it's enough time for these guys to print out the value. And notice how consumer gets sh showed up before producer. Because once you create go routine, you have no control of the order in which they're going to run. Now, this, go, this consumer did not have to wait to this producer, hence it was able to run first, because there's nothing that said, hey, you have to wait for it. Now, if on the other hand, we're producing values and we say, okay, channel colon equals make some channel of int, and we say, well, uh, we're going to make an unbuffered one, and you get this channel, you get this channel, but for the producer, this is an output channel, um, that on which it can send integers and then for the consumer it's an input channel on which it can only consume integers right so now we can say here you do um, for i equals to zero i less than you know 10 or whatever or 20 maybe i plus plus and then we're going to say on the out channel, we want you to send some value i times 2. And then after you finish sending, I want you to close this channel out. Okay? And for this guy, we're going to say um, for v is some value um, equals to range over this input channel. And we know that when we use range over a channel, so long as it's going to close, we're going to eventually just terminate, right? And so I can say fmt that print ln you know v for example, and I'm gonna sleep for one hundred millisecond, and we'll see how many values I should be able to print out my all my twenty values in that time, and um, you know there we go, okay, so um, because this gets to i less than twenty, so that's nineteen, so nineteen times two is thirty eight, so I print out all my values, and now. We don't have to close. Before, we had to close because uh, we wanted um, to use range and um, thing. But here, what's going to happen is my, um, my for loop here, my consumer is going to block on this channel because it's not closed because waiting for this guy potentially to write some more values. But guess what? Eventually, my main will end and terminate my program. So it is not a problem, right? You know, we don't even get to see that it's, it's blocking and waiting. Um, for that, we'll have to do something like a select, right? We have to do like for, keep doing stuff, select, um, try to read from this channel, 
case, try to read from in, right? And then print it out. And then if I can read, I do default. Waiting for the value from producer, right? And so if we have that, now we'll see I'm sitting in a for loop area and I'm trying to select. And I'm gonna try and read from um, I'm gonna try and read from this input and then if I can't if I read I can print it out. If I can't, I'll print out this message saying that oh hey default that uh, I can go wrong and keep looking. And of course eventually my program will oh where is it? Cannot refer to unexported FMT. Where is that? FMT print capital P. Come on. So run. And you can see I finished printing on my values ever since and was just waiting. Let's reduce this from 100 milliseconds to maybe 10. And let's see. Still a lot. <laughs> um, one millisecond. Still a lot. But you get the idea is that, um, you know, I, I could prove to you that how those values got printed out uh, ahead um, before. And so, hello, I'm the producer, you know, and that's what's happening is that here, my consumer is waiting and then they start printing out values and then eventually the producers got run and it sent one value zero and then consumer again waited a little bit and then it got a value from the um, producer and then it waited a whole lot more and it got another value from the producer and as you can see, that's what's going on, right? So hopefully you can see now how this is happening through the magic of our little illustration here. Again, this is for illustration purposes only. A lot of simplification here, but hopefully this conveys the idea. Key takeaway, go keyword or the go statement created a go routine, which manages the execution of a function. It creates a context for that function. Other key takeaway, your program ends when mains end. Big, big, big takeaway. So if you ever do anything with Go routines and you don't see the output from them, chances are your main is not waiting long enough. Okay? And your program is ending and killing everything. I'm going to cut this off here. Don't want to make it too long. I want to spend most of the time on diagrams and pictures so you can understand what we're doing so far. Okay. See you in the next video. I hope you're enjoying this. I hope you're still excited. Spread the word. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Take care. Thanks again for your time. Very, very much appreciate you spending time with me. Bye.